Yesterday, Dr. Don Carson joined us to explain that there are 20 big themes in the Bible that develop from Genesis to Revelation. And he said that there are another 50, 60, or 70 smaller themes there as well. We're back with Dr. Don Carson again today, the editor of the new NIV Zondervan Study Bible, which releases in about a month. And instead of talking more about what biblical theology is, which we talked about yesterday, uh, Dr. Carson, I want you to show us particularly how biblical theology works. And I want you to focus on one theme for us today, if you will. For people who are wondering what biblical theology is all about, show us how the theme of the temple develops from Genesis to Revelation in God's plan. All right. If we think of temple as the meeting place between God and people, then there is a sense in which the Garden of Eden is a kind of proto-temple. And um, many people have drawn parallels between themes in Genesis 1 and 2, understanding of what the temple is in later scriptural writings. But the temple is also a place of sacrifice, and there are sacrifices that are developing, for example, when Abraham is being called out of Ur of the Chaldees and, and so forth. The first time that there is a structure is in the tent of meeting before the tabernacle is built. And then the tabernacle is built, and many, many chapters of Scripture are devoted to discussing its um, proportions, the most holy place, who can approach the holy God in the most holy place, and when, on uh, Yom Kippurim, the Day of Atonement, um, once a year, um, only with the prescribed blood of the prescribed sacrifices, a bull and a goat, covering both the sins of the priest and his family and the sins of all the people, and... Um, uh, sprinkling that blood on the Ark of the Covenant behind the veil, only the high priest allowed to do it, and even then only once a year, and so forth. And so this is tied to the years of the wilderness wandering and the glory of God coming upon the tabernacle, uh, the, the detailed prescriptions of, of how the, 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 the tabernacle works and, and the role of the priests and, and the glory of God manifesting himself there and so forth. The story goes on, of course, so that once people get into the promised land, the tabernacle is the central point where God meets with his people. The priests are connected to the tabernacle, but are supposed to also be teaching people the law of God, the way of God. But sadly, there are cycles of degeneration and decay and degeneration and decay, so that parts of the story actually find the Philistines stealing the Ark of the Covenant from the tabernacle, thinking that somehow they've managed to capture Israel's God. God does not wipe them out, but has his own way of, of uh, guaranteeing that the tabernacle is reconstituted with the, with the Ark of the Covenant in it. Eventually, of course, you get to the remarkable chapters 2 Samuel 6 and 7, which are hugely uh, formative for the rest of biblical theology. David has been king at this juncture for uh, seven years, and then, but only over the southern two tribes. After seven years, he becomes king over the entire uh, country, all 12 tribes, and takes Jerusalem and makes it his capital. And, um, and, and the Davidic dynasty is, is promised by God in 2 Samuel 7. The Ark of the Covenant is brought there in 2 Samuel 6. So now you have three huge themes coming together that control a great deal of typology for the rest of the Bible. Jerusalem, kingdom, dynasty of David, and, and finally um, the tabernacle that eventually becomes the, the, the temple under Solomon in the next generation. So now you have a firm place with, um, again, the dimensions being laid out. The plans are according to God's design. Um, much of it uh, uh, designed to teach that the only approach to God for sinful human beings, uh, his covenant people, are by the means that God himself has ordained, by the sacrifices that God himself has commanded. Uh, in the terms that God himself lays out, by the priest that God himself ordains, by the shed blood that God himself prescribes. And all of these things get hammered into the nation and, and begin to point forward to, to the need for a sacrifice that will, will actually finally deal with sin and, and, and prove to be more transformational than the blood of bulls and goats. But nevertheless, um, here is the center for the Passover, here is the center for uh, the Day of Atonement, and for the morning and evening sacrifices, and, and, and so on.
this then runs eventually to the degeneration of the entire nation, that northern tribes are taken off uh, into captivity by the Assyrians in 721, 722. Then the southern kingdom is, is broken up and, and taken off in a succession of raids, and finally the destruction of the city and of the temple in 586 B.C., and, and this under the Neo-Babylonians. And the, the, for, for many people, this is unthinkable because this is threatening the Davidic dynasty, which God promised would be uh, perpetual. And it's threatening Jerusalem, which is now uh, destroyed. And it, it's threatening the temple. Uh, it destroys the temple. Uh, how, how can that be? This is the meeting place between God and his people. And perhaps one of the most insightful passages is, is Ezekiel chapters 8 through 11, where, where God himself, in a vision, shows how the city will be destroyed. It's not that Nebuchadnezzar is so strong that God doesn't have a chance, poor chap, but rather God judicially abandons the city because of its sin, even though the exiles find it difficult to imagine that God could do this. And then the interesting thing in chapter 11 is that God says to the exiles by the banks of the Kebar River through the mouth of Ezekiel that even though they're far away, God says, I will be a sanctuary to them. That's temple language. So in other words, the real sanctuary is where God is. It's, it's not where the masonry is. It's, it's not in a geographical location. God is not restricted to Jerusalem. God is not restricted to um, uh, a box. God is not restricted to a, a, a cubicle room behind a, a veil. And, and I will be a sanctuary to them becomes very strong. Nevertheless, in God's covenanted mercies, he nevertheless calls the people back to Jerusalem. Some come back, first in a wave of 50,000, um, under the ministry of Haggai and Zechariah. Um, the, the, a small temple is rebuilt again under the ministry of Nehemiah. There is uh, the rebuilding of the city, the repopulation of the city, and great celebrations of covenantal renewal that focus again on the temple. And the reason for focusing on the temple is chapter after chapter on covenantal renewal in Nehemiah, and very, very little on, let's say, what we would call moral law, precisely because what you must have is reconciliation to God. And under the terms of the Old Covenant, that was done through the temple and the sacrifices that God ordained. So that really brings us close to the end of the Old Testament storyline. Uh, when you come to the New Testament, it's not long before Jesus himself says, according to John chapter 2, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And neither his opponents nor his disciples had a clue what he was talking about. But John quietly comments, after he was raised from the dead, then his disciples remembered his words and they believed the scriptures. So that Jesus becomes the crucial temple, that is, the, the real, the ultimate meeting place between God and sinful people. So that the typological lines, the trajectories of the Old Covenant come together in him. He's the ultimate priest. He's the ultimate sacrifice. His flesh is the veil. And his shattered, broken body is the shattered, broken temple that rises on the third day to become the real meeting place between God and sinful people. So in the New Testament, the antitype of these strands uh, regarding the temple e emerge in three ways, two big ones and one small one. The, the, the first big one is, is Jesus himself is the ultimate temple. The second big one is the church of Jesus Christ is the temple. That is, it's the meeting place between God and sinners. Uh, this is where God speaks through his temple to the surrounding nations. And the, in, in being constituted the church, the church becomes the meeting place between God and sinners and thus becomes a temple as well. And then in one or two pages only, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That language is used further there. And you could track out various further emphases until you come to the book of, of Revelation. Um, th there are temple themes throughout the book that are really quite remarkable. But for want of time, let me just skip to the last two chapters, where you have the final vision um, of a new heaven and a new earth. Or again, the vision changes, and it's now a vision of the new Jerusalem. And yet this Jerusalem is also a bride. One of the things that apocalyptic literature does is mingle its metaphors. It, it, it mixes them together. But what is interesting is that in the vision of the new Jerusalem, uh, John the seer says, I saw no temple there, for the Lord God Almighty and its Lamb are the temple. So once again, you don't need the edifice because you've got God. You have now complete reconciliation. You don't need a mediating priest. Christ is there. And, and the new Jerusalem itself is depicted uh, symbolically as a perfectly cubicle. Uh, 
Um, it, it's, it's a perfect cube. And there's only one cube in the Old Testament, namely the most holy place. So, so you can't have a temple in the most holy place. All the people of God are in the most holy place. They're in the temple. They're in the presence of the living God. And, and, and so now you've really come to something like the Garden of Eden, only much better. And, and, and so all of these pieces together form a, a whole tapestry of, of biblical theological unpacking that is one of the strands that ties the entire Bible together. That is glorious fuel for worship. Thank you, Dr. Carson, for that survey. And thank you for laboring for so many years to raise up an army of leaders who are equipped to lead churches to better understand the major themes that run through the Bible, like the temple. Thank you. And to this end, Dr. Carson edited a new study Bible. It's officially titled the NIV Zondervan Study Bible. And if biblical theology like this is of interest to you, and I hope it is, you should check it out. It's called the NIV Zondervan Study Bible, and it releases in about a month. Well, we have time for one more question with Dr. Carson tomorrow, and I want to ask him, how do I explain sin to someone for the very first time? It's a question faced by preachers, and pastors, and college campus ministers, and parents, all of us at some point. Dr. Carson will answer tomorrow. I'm your host, Tony Ranke. Thanks for listening to the Ask Pastor John podcast.